Well, I, I cast around looking for some kind of image to go with the theme today, and I found it quite a challenging, uh, challenging task. Uh, and, and I chose this theme. It's uh, simply a cross. Uh, and I'll come back to it a little bit more. But I'm putting it to one side and just reminding ourselves that this is the image that has something to say to us about the service today. And as you think about what Tibor has read and look at that image, just wonder what strikes you. Uh, the heading of, that I've given the service is that God has broken through to other nations. Now this is uh, the words of Acts chapter 11 verse 18 from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. God has broken through to other nations. We shouldn't be surprised that this idea was uh, in the Bible because we've just sung Psalm 100 uh, to open our service today and it's an invitation to the whole earth to sing praise to God, to come with joy before him. But it's the song, it's a poem and a song written by a tiny group of people in the world scene in, in Judea. It's their song. How, how would this open up to the whole world? Well, we know that it was there from the beginning, from the very first book of their holy scriptures. The promise was that through them, blessing would come to the whole earth. Somehow that seemed to get overlooked. They found it hard to be God's people. Um, why didn't God choose some other people? That's what I've heard one Jewish person say. It's been hard to be Jewish. And so here, here is this challenge. How, how is this tiny uh, a nation of people to be a nation that brings blessing? It was a nation that got trampled on by the other great powers. They were taken captive in Egypt of the, in, the, in the time uh, of uh, Joseph and his family. Uh, they were trampled down by the Assyrians in uh, uh, 722 BC. They were de devastated. Uh, the re rest of the nation was devastated by the Babylonians in 586 BC. And yet they had this, this hope that God would somehow work through them, that indeed the house that they rebuilt, the temple, remember in Isaiah, uh, it, Isaiah says that, that, that the temple would be a place of prayer for all nations, all nations. Jesus quoted this, you remember, in the synagogue at Nazareth. This is what, what uh, was expected, that, that somehow it would break out. And yet the truth was very different. And so it seemed. Uh, the criticism, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish people were so insular, so different, so defensive. They kept themselves apart and separate. They were as socially unconnected with other nations as you could almost be. There were exceptions. Josephus, the Jewish historian, saw where the power lay, and he wrote a history of the Jewish people, but he wrote it for the Romans because he had sided with the Romans. So we have Josephus' writings about the, uh, the history of the Jews, and we have Josephus' writings about the history of the Jewish wars, including the war with the Romans in uh, 70 AD. Josephus was roughly contemporaneous with Jesus. But they were so different. And Rome found them so different and so difficult to manage that even though they had client kings in the country, in the end, they just devastated the country and annihilated and destroyed the temple in the year 70. And the event was celebrated on the Arch of Titus in Rome. If we ever get a chance to travel to Rome, Go there and see it and see the Jewish menorah being carried by the triumphant Romans. They had wiped the Jewish people out of Israel. And yet, Jesus had said that the city would be destroyed. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, remember your salvation is coming near. And so what happens in this little passage that's been read to us is really very momentous. God has broken through Luke is telling us in Acts. And there are four things I want to say to you. The first is I want to point out that back in Jerusalem, Peter had his critics. I want to take you to Antioch, where believers talk to Gentiles. I want to take you to the word Christians, which is a nickname that stuck. And I want to think about the authentication of the faith. So firstly then, Jerusalem, 
Peter had his critics. Um, just as Peter relayed last week uh, to Cornelius the vision that he'd had, so when, when God breaks through and the reports come back from what's happening in Antioch, the Jerusalem Christians are puzzled. They want to know what's happened. Peter is, is, has, uh, he's, he's hearing, first of all, a, cha- a question about his going into a house of a Gentile. There were some people who were so shocked that he would do that. What has a good Jew got to do with going into a Gentile house? Well, Peter doesn't give a, uh, an explanation in a sort of a point-by-point point case. He just says, this is what happened. And he describes his vision. And then he tells us something that he didn't tell us in the previous chapter. He mentioned that the brothers went with him. But, but here he talks in, chapter, uh, in this chapter, uh, Acts 11, And verse 12, he talks about six brothers. Why did he take six brothers? William Barclay, uh, an older commentator on the book of Acts, a very uh, learned uh, uh, Scot, I might say, a Glaswegian, I believe, uh, who died in 1978. William Barclay uh, had great knowledge of uh, classical Greek and of New Testament Greek, which he taught. And he makes the point that in in both Egypt and in Rome, seven witnesses confirmed a message. Seven. And so here's Peter saying, I took six with me. And we went to the house and told what God had done. We were there because Cornelius invited us. So so Peter's critics, uh, uh, this was going to be an issue that rose again. Paul has to deal with the question in Galatians. There are some people who are saying, oh, look, if you really want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to become a Jew first because Jesus was Jewish. You need to eat the food we eat. You need to have our rituals and our ceremonies. But Peter's saying no, and the church had to deal with this question later on. But thankfully, what he said in uh, Jerusalem was enough to persuade the critics that the Gentiles too had received the Holy Spirit. And this was enough to persuade the critics that God makes no distinction between races. He grants his spirit irrespective of the culture you come from. If you receive the word of God and believe, as it's mentioned in chapter 11, verse 1, and chapter 15, verse 7. And so we have uh, Peter's defense of this position. You'll notice that it began way back. uh, Philip went to the Samaritans. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now Peter has gone to a a Roman, to a Gentile, at the invitation of the Gentile. And his family, they received the Spirit. But today something different is going to happen. And to to discover that, we go to the city of Antioch. Now, I'm I'm expecting that I'm... You maybe don't know a lot about Antioch. You've heard it's mentioned in the Bible... I want to take you to Antioch for a few minutes. Antioch was the third, William Barclay says, it was the third city of the empire. I've looked at different lists, and it's always listed in the top five cities of the Roman Empire. Rome was the mother city, and then uh, Alexandria, which had been established by Alexander the Great. Uh, Then uh, he lists uh, Antioch. And then Ephesus, and then there's a big debate which comes next. Some would say Constantinople, which was to become, in a few centuries later, the great epicenter of the uh, Christian world before it was overrun by the Muslims in the 6th century, 7th century. So, so here is Antioch, and it's, it's on this river. And it, I, as soon as I saw this artist's impression, it gave me a kind of feeling of like, It's a bit like Paris. I don't know if you know there's islands and bridges across to it. Uh, Here is a map of it that I put in the leaflet. And I don't know if you're able to see it because it's very tiny. And actually, if you orient the map the same way as the city, there are a couple of details which I'll point out to you. Uh, The first is Main Street. Romans always liked Main Street to go straight through the middle of town. So here it is. And this is... It's called Syrian Antioch because there were two cities called Antioch. They're named after the same person. Um, He named them after himself, that is. 
was, he was a, one of Alexander's generals. Uh, and it's on the river, uh, the River Orontes. I don't know if you've ever traveled on a P&O boat. P&O love to name their ships with the letter O. And so the Orontes was one of their ships. And so here is this river. I never realized there was an Orontes River. And here is uh, the theater. We, we know that, uh, that uh, Roman cities always have these amphitheaters built into the hillside. Well, there's one in, uh, in Antioch. I've actually probably spent too much time looking at Antioch on the, on the computer this week because I discovered that in 1933, uh, Princeton University was invited to send a, an archaeological team to dig and discover the city because it hadn't been really uncovered. It was just known that this was where it should be. And there was a, a modern-day city there. Well, modern in 1933 in the Middle East was pretty old-fashioned by our standards. But this team went, and not only did they have photographs of the dig in black and white and color, but they also had some films of the digging and so you, you had this scene where there were all these olive trees, but each one was on a little island. And uh, at the sides of the island, they dug down about my height and discovered that this was where the city was. And as they kept going, they found dozens of mosaics on the floor. Those mosaics from those Roman city are now in museums around the world, as well as in Turkey. So uh, this was a city where people indulged themselves. It was at the end of the Silk Road. If you go down Main Street and head off, heading east, uh, you're going to come eventually to China. This is where the silk came from. You'll come back through Afghanistan. You'll come back and you'll bring the silks and the spices from the east to the west. So it was a trading city. The Hippodrome, what's um, I'm just wondering how many people know what the word hippo means in the Greek word hippo. Horse. Yes, it means horse. Yeah, that's right. So uh, hippopotamus is a river horse. A hippodrome with us is a race course for horses. All right. So uh, the race courses for horses weren't grass the way our race courses are. They were long and narrow and they had chariot races running down one side, a 180 degree turn and coming back the other way. This was a place where people went for the races, for the spectacle. Uh, and you can see that there's a hillside there. And there was, uh, according to uh, uh, William Barclay, there was uh, uh, the goddess Daphne was worshipped there. Daphne seems to me an old-fashioned name. Uh, it's, it's a name which is, has a, means a plant nowadays. But, of course, Daphne was a Roman goddess as well. She became, she was turned into... Uh, a plant uh, because Apollo wanted her. Anyway, that, that, that's enough. But this was a pleasure city as well as a trading city, and people went there. And what we read was that after, after the persecution of Stephen, way back when we read that in Acts chapter 8, after that, the disciples, the believers were scattered. And we read, uh, Tibor read for us, that some of them went up and they went to Phoenicia, they went to Cyprus, and they went to Antioch. And they talked to Jews only. But it says that other, other, other believers came from Cyprus and Cyrene to Antioch and they spoke to Hellenists. They spoke to Greek people. And the interesting thing is they're unnamed. How did this breakthrough from inside the confines of Judaism, how did it burst through to uh, non-Jewish people? And the answer is that it was in the conversation of unnamed believers. And I think this is just really a, a beautiful testimony to the fact that God is at work, uh, even despite what we as, as uh, Christian believers might be saying and doing, God is at work in people's lives. God will use our words. He'll use our conversations. And God will change people. So here it's unnamed believers so that there's no one person to be lionized in all of this. I suppose if we were to pick up one name that Luke mentions, it's the name Barnabas. Um, I, I want to, to think, uh, before, we, before I mention Barnabas in any more detail, let's imagine we're, we're going to go to Antioch. Here's, here is a Roman road leading into Antioch today. Right? It's still paved. It's... Uh, 
more than 2,000 years old. How many of our roads last 2,000 years without much maintenance? Well, the, the Roman roads are there. And I want to just think about some of the words that have been used to describe believers. Let's think, first of all, about the disciples. They're called disciples. A disciple is somebody who learns a discipline. The discipline of learning a musical instrument, for example. The discipline of particular study. The disciplines associated with growing garden, a garden. There are all kinds of disciplines. And there are Christian disciplines as well. They're learning about Jesus. There's something to be learned here. So Christians, in a way, can be described as people with L plates on. You know, I'm, there's a bumper sticker that says, uh, I'm not perfect, but God hasn't finished with me yet. I don't know if you've seen that one. And it's good to remember that we're in a process of being conformed more and more to the mind and will of Jesus. So that's the first thing. In Acts chapter 6, the disciples are called, uh, they're called disciples, and that means learners. In Acts chapter 9, they're called saints, a misused and misunderstood word nowadays. We tend to think of saints as people who have been canonized by an ecclesiastical hierarchy and have some elevated status and powers. And so, but that's not the way the Bible uses it. The Bible uses saints to describe the fact that the Christian people were kind of different. They were set apart. They revered the name of God. They... They, uh, they, they will take life seriously because it matters. Uh, they'll take your life seriously and be concerned for you because it mat your life matters. There, there, are, there are things about Christians that show that set them apart. Of course, the God of Israel was a God who was set apart. And that was one of the things that the Jewish people found hard to remember because they were kind of seduced by other gods again and again. The God of mammon, money. You can't serve God and money, says Jesus. Only one can be the master. And there are other gods. The goddess of pleasure. And so on. So there are different other things that you know, we are maybe tempted to conform to. But we're, our lives should be distinctively different. There should be something about us that people find uh, attractive and winsome. But that's not all. They're called brothers and sisters in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 9. And this is about a new and emerging sense of family. There are people you care for in ways that you care for your own family. Well, of course, your own family is unique. But, but these people love me too. And they are my brothers and sisters. And, and uh, they want to, to uh, encourage me in my life. And so there's a sense of... God being our Father. And this is what Jesus said would happen. When you pray, pray, our Father. And suddenly we become brothers and sisters by that prayer. And God's children together. So here's a new word. Uh, the brothers and the sisters. And then there's they're those who are being saved. There's a lot of futility in the world. And uh, the word saved has the idea of being rescued. And we love the idea that Bondi has a rescue team. You know, Bondi Rescue, the lifesavers are there every day of the year. We, we, uh, we're so proud of our uh, SES services. We, we're uh, in awe of the work that firemen and policemen are called to do and, and others, the AMBOs, uh, those who are the first responders. We're happy about that kind of salvation that sort of contributes to the rescuing of our physical lives. But what about our moral and emotional lives? What rescues us from futility, from idolatry, from hopelessness? Well, you matter to God, and God will rescue you from that. And he will conform you more and more to the image of his Son by his Holy Spirit. We are being saved. We have been turned from darkness to light. And as the Bible says, whereas once we loved darkness... Now we, we love the light. And then another word for these disciples, the saints, the brothers and sisters, those who are being saved, is the followers of the way. And this is uh, one that's particular in Acts. Luke likes this idea of them being followers of the way of Jesus. It suggests we're pilgrims. We're moving on a journey. 
Uh, we're going forward. How often do you hear our politicians talk about going forward? Going forward, we're doing this. Going forward, we're doing that. Well, if we're Christians, we are going forward. But we need to be careful about which way is forward and what is the way of Jesus? Where is that taking us? So here is a range of words that are used to describe the early believers by Acts, by Luke in Acts. But there is another one, and it's represented in this cross that I chose, and it's the word Christianos. If, if you, uh, we're all a little bit familiar with the Greek alphabet. You've heard of the Alpha variant. You've heard of the Delta variant. Well, here's the word Christ. It's chi. The, the X in Greek is a CH sound. <laughs> Uh, the, the R looks like, uh, that's the letter Rho. I hope we never get to the Rho variant of, of uh, coronavirus. The I, the S is a sigma, and the T is a, like our T. So this is Christianus. And this is the word that was first used in Antioch. In Antioch, it was a put-down, really, a bit of a light-hearted put-down. These people are always talking about Christ. And presumably they thought this was a surname, just as Marcus Aurelius and others had uh, family names and uh, given names. So they probably thought, well, uh, this must be the surname of the Jesus they're talking about. And John Stott says it reminds us that Christ was at the heart of the Christian message. And this word, which we use to describe ourselves so often, uh, comes from Antioch. And it, it, like the other terms, speaks significantly about, about characteristics of the believers. This time, it's that they are Christ-centered in their thinking. And as a church, we should be maybe think to ourselves, we're happy to take the name Christian, but if we go back and look at these images and think about the idea of uh, learning, of being uh, being shaped in a, in a particular way by the, the way we think and pray. If we think about the idea of belonging as a family and of, about being rescued from things that we used to, but we've turned from because we, we see a, a sort of futility and a hopelessness down that path or this path. And it's Christ who leads us and we journey in his way. How true are these things of us as a church? Are we learning? How do we feel about one another? These are uh, personally and socially relational terms. It's not about a building. It's not about money. It's not about so many things that we can get sidetracked into thinking. These people in Acts, these are the Christians. And I want to just finally pick about a few minutes to say uh, there's an authentication provided in this letter which challenges us all and um, it's a, there's a beautiful correlation here it's between Acts 2 and 4 on the one hand and Acts 11 where we are at the moment what does it say in Acts 2 and 4 well you remember in Jerusalem at the very beginning uh, there were people there who had come as pilgrims to the city and they were learning about Jesus but they had run out of resources they couldn't go back They'd stayed, outstayed their, their, their financial resources. And, the, and the, of course, the most vulnerable were the widows. And, and so the church decided that they should be catered for. And the idea was that each of them should receive according to their need. The church was going to be generous and uh, give to meet the needs of the widows. And what do we discover in Acts? Well, we discover in Acts 11 that the... Uh, the uh, Antioch Christians, the new word that's come into the vocabulary, the vocabulary not just of Antioch but of the entire Western world, this, these people are going to be described as a people who give according to their ability. It's a wealthy city and they've heard from Agabus, a uh, prophet, that there's, there's a, uh, going to be a famine and that famine hit in the, in the reign of Claudius. Claudius was emperor from 41 to 52 AD. So it was in that time frame uh, that this, uh, there was great need in the church in, in Jerusalem. And the believers, the Christian believers, 
the ones who were of Greek-speaking background, who weren't part of the Jewish family, they determined to give according to their ability to meet the needs of the, uh, the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, so what is the authentication of the message? Well, I want to suggest we have a few common or garden sayings. We talk about where the rubber hits the road. You've heard that saying? Um, I was reading through the week of somebody trying to explain uh, some of this kind of saying into to a person who isn't a native English speaker. Uh, and if you li literally trans translate it, what does it actually mean to another person if they don't have that saying? It's quite interesting. So what do we mean where the rubber hits the road? Uh, when <laughs> and <laughs> Perhaps uh, I'll have a go, but here we go. When the rubber hits the road, it seems to me, when, when actually you get moving, where will it take you there? You know, will, is it up to it? Will it do the job? So, uh, so how does it work out? Uh, put your money where your mouth is. You've heard that. That's another funny one to try and translate into another language. If they don't have that saying, what does it mean? They may have a saying that means something similar, but it seems to mean that you're speaking about something, but how does it affect your money, your hip pocket nerve, your resources? I've already referred to Jesus saying you cannot serve God and money. So the question is, does your money serve your God? Or is your God uh, just uh, lip service because your money determines your life? Put your money where your mouth is. Well, what we found uh, in... Uh, Antioch was that it worked in the lives of these Christians. We asked, does it work? I think we've got a saying about a two-bob watch. I don't know if anybody here remembers a saying about a two-bob watch. But a watch that costs two shillings is not going to be found on the wrist of our session clerk. Is that right? <laughs> Always before service, Keith looks at his watch, long jeans, and says we've got 15 seconds to go, or however much it is. Very precise. A two-bob watch wouldn't give you that time. In fact, a two-bob watch would probably have stopped quite a while ago. So does it work? That's the, the acid test is, does it work? This is what William Barclay said about whether it works. He says, the proof of Christianity is that it works, that it does change men. He's talking back in the 70s or even earlier, uh, so he doesn't use gender-inclusive terminology. Apologies to the ladies that it does change men, that it does make bad men good, that it does bring to men the spirit of God. It's when a man, man's words are guaranteed by his deeds that the world is presented with an argument for Christianity which will brook no denial. How genuine is your faith? Well, do your deeds show it? Do our deeds show it? Are we the kind of church that would be described by the rich vocabulary of Acts? Because we, we, we take to ourselves the name of Christian. Is Christ at the center of our life? We need to ask that. And we need to adjust our priorities by the Spirit of God, by God's grace, to make sure that it is so. So let us pray that these things will be so for us. I have a prayer that I wrote um, two days ago, which I thought I'd share with you, and then uh, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. So uh, let us pray.